For those who are who are new to how we how we run these, you know, basically we have kind of a guided start where we got a couple uh, pre-written discussion questions to kind of get you guys introduced to what our panelists do uh, and some get let them get to show some of their expertise. And then from there, we're going to open it up toward the end uh, for you guys to be able to jump in and, and you know ask questions and really get to know uh, some more about the uh, regenerative blue economy that we're going to be talking about today. And we're really excited because this is on the seaworthy front, you know, as as we promote innovation and entrepreneurship for the oceans, we're really, really focused on this specific solutions for regeneration and what that means. We will we will dive into today, pun intended. Um, but you know, really, there's just there's just such an opportunity, and more importantly, a need to make people aware of this space, make people understand, uh, you know, that sustainability is a step in the right direction, but regeneration is kind of where what what happens next or afterward and what that all looks like so with that um you guys want to get started how about Shaylin you want to introduce kind of your background and and you know kind of just kick us off yeah sure thanks Daniel really excited to be here with you all thanks uh, everyone for joining my name is Shaylin Jotishi I'm a a uh, researcher and a, a storyteller uh, working at the think tank New America in Washington, D.C. My mission is to um, understand, uh, design, and communicate strategies and ideas that can help us all just get the most out of quality education, decent work, and technological innovation for everyone. Uh, so, you know, my connectivity to Seaworthy and its mission is in sort of uh, catalyzing innovation and entrepreneurship. I'm an interloper in the ocean sciences space. That's not my background, but um, I do have a background working with universities and colleges on innovation ecosystem building, as well as the national uh, US science and technology policy enterprise and how that can support uh, some of the doers uh, uh, trying to spur ocean innovation. So really excited to be here with you all. Um, I'm we're all virtual these days. So we can't really hand business cards. So I'm just going to drop in the chat my contact information. Um, I'd love to connect with you all and uh, hope you'll share your uh, uh, information as well in the chat. Looking forward to connecting. Awesome, Shailen. Yeah. And, you know, part of our goal, by the way, of these events is just to make these experts accessible to you. And so we're, we're you know, really excited to see Shailen just kick it right off with that. Uh, Jonathan, you want to give a little bit more about your background? Sure. I mean, I'll give you a little bit. It's uh, it's broad <laughs> in a lot of different ways. Um, but you know, ultimately, um, I've worked at the intersection of you know innovation and technology for you know many decades now. Um, I do have a policy background, actually in affordable housing subsidy streams, and so I spent time you know working on the Hill, um, and also I spent time making sure that those policies lined up with the innovation and the deployment exercises that are occurring in the market. Um, I've done that in a, in a lot of different things. I've worked in a number of startups. I've worked with incubators. Um, I helped AT&T launch their context aware platform, which makes sense out of the technology on your phone for delivering um, contextual location based messages. I've just done a lot of stuff. Um, and about, you know, a year or so ago, I, I, I sort of woke up and I said, you know, it was evolving, but I more or less woke up and said, why am I not doing this on behalf of the earth and the ocean? Um, and so I rededicated all of those, you know, skills and that experience to focusing on the ocean space. And I will dive in much deeper to some of this as we go, but ultimately I just became, you know, pretty passionate about the intersection of racial, social, and environmental justice as, as the backdrop for what we can do with regenerative ocean economies and how these integrated systems have effects um, globally in so many different ways. And I think that we can use those tools to, to change the course of, of, of humanity right now from a climate perspective, but also how do we interact with each other and how do we uplift at-risk populations that have otherwise been left behind? So that's my focus. Um, but ultimately I'm a, I'm a data set guy and I'm a policy guy and I'm a financial guy. And, and I think my role here is to, to be supportive to all the people who are doing such great work in this space. Um, so we'll start with that and we can go deeper later. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, just to kind of put the seaworthy twist to all of this, you know, policy and, and development goals and all these things are, are really important, right, to drive the big picture. And at the same time, it doesn't mean as much unless there's tangible action behind it. And so that's really our goal is to, to loop in with these experts and loop into these trends and say, okay, well, this is a goal. How do we on the ground start to develop these solutions and, and really facilitate that? 
So with that, I'm going to kick off with our first question, which is, what can you tell us about the current ecosystem for facilitating ocean or general science, tech, and innovation? Uh, Shailen, I'm going to throw it to you to start. Yep, absolutely. I, I think that's a really great question. And, you know, um, uh, I think Jonathan and I are going to have a lot of synergy in what we're about to say here, because one of the observations that I wanted to share with you all today is actually something I think we ought to be optimistic about. It's a trying time. Um, lots of really difficult things happening in our country and in our world. But um, I think one thing that's been actually really valuable for science innovation and ocean science innovation as well mm -hmm. has been the national and global reckoning of racial injustice. I think that's actually been a boon to the sciences and to um, the ocean sciences. You know, I... Um, uh, if, if we were just to think about the uh, coastal regions in our country, they're some of the most diverse in the country. Uh, LA, Seattle, Miami, Houston, New Orleans, Boston, New York City. They're some of the most racially diverse places in our country. And I think if we're thinking about problem solving and public problem solving in particular, having a user-centered design to that work is extremely important. I think these coastal regions have the most to lose if we don't act on ocean innovation, but they also have the most to gain once we act on ocean innovation. So I think the national a uh, philanthropic environment has reoriented itself to taking a racial justice lens to what it funds in the innovation space. I think to some extent VCs might be waking up to that as well. I think universities that incubate and try to accelerate innovation on their campuses like what you're doing with Seaworthy Daniel at University of Miami are really waking up. I wanted to just flag a uh, panel presentation that uh, a couple of my colleagues and I organized a few weeks back with the National Academy of Inventors around fostering inclusive and equitable uh, entrepreneurship ecosystems. Um, this was a session uh, that spanned from Wichita, Kansas to uh, Long Beach, California. And it really got into the nitty gritty of what universities as boundary spanning organizations and ecosystem builders can do to substantively move the needle on inclusive innovation ecosystem building. So um, I think Daniel, one development that's been actually quite positive has been um, the fact that we're finally waking up and being mindful of those who um, are black, Latinx, Native American, who have historically been excluded from conversations of innovation and who really haven't derived a proportionate level of benefit from innovation if we look at sort of trend analysis. Um, the other thing I'd say is more from, you know, the policy lens, um, which is, I, uh, you know, um, I, I actually have an optimistic story to share about the federal environment. Um, you know, I think the confirmation of um, Panchnathan Seth Ruthman, Dr. Panch for short, as director of the National Science Foundation, which funds most non-medical basic research in this country, has been an extraordinary boon for innovators across the country. Um, you know, Panch is a very well-respected scientist and engineer. Uh, he's actually both, if you believe it. Um, he comes from Arizona State University, which has been ranked number one in innovation for the past six consecutive years and um, is a patent holder himself. Um, and I think Ponch is really going to bring a new vision to the National Science Foundation that's focused on technology development as well as fundamental research. And he's serving a six year term. And I think his uh, vision and work is going to um, be felt by us on the ground, regardless of who controls Congress or the White House. So actually, it's something I'd flag up. Um, I think um, if you look at objective nonpartisan measures of science and technology, the current uh, federal leadership has been unequivocally uh, a failure for American science and American innovation. Um, but uh, in bringing Ponch to lead the National Science Foundation and Kelvin Durgmeyer and OSTP and Walt Copen and in NIST and the Department of Commerce, 
um, I think we have a lot to be happy about. I think we have a lot to be optimistic about when it comes to the broader big picture of science and innovation in, in America. So my two cents there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Your, your two cents is always deeper than my, my dollar of cents. I'll, I'll put it that way. Uh, Jonathan, I'm sure you have some stuff to add. Yeah. I mean, you, you touched on a lot of it and I already kicked off with my thoughts on the you know, overlap of the you know, the racial, social, and environmental justice opportunities here. But, you know, Daniel, your question was, um, you know, about the ecosystem. And, and I just want to zoom way, way out in terms of the opportunity with the ocean. There's such an interconnectivity of all the elements. I'm going to dive into probably later in, in some of our talks. So I'm going to get deep into like actual ocean tech. But I think I have to look at the high level of what's happening in climate in general. Obviously, the ocean is most dynamically single body tied to our climate, right? It provides every other breath we take. It sequesters more carbon and heat than anything else on Earth. And so we have to look at climate um, progress in relation to ocean progress. And, and sometimes I, I work with, you know, young kids who are you know, interested in the earth and they're, they're terrified and they wanna know, you know why I'm excited and it's hard to give them this answer. But, but ultimately I have to step out of the ocean for a second and say, you know, what's going on overall for climate. And so I'm gonna run through this real, real fast because I think it's just a nice backdrop. There's, there's the Commodity Futures Trading Commission which is you know, this derivative regulator in, in DC. And, and you might ask, you know, they just focus on derivatives, why does it matter? But they made this statement recently which is climate risk is financial risk. And when they speak with that one voice in this administration, that's a huge signal. And so, you know, very quickly, there was, there was a formation of the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, meaning do companies, do asset managers have to talk about the risk of climate to their portfolio? They've never had to do that before. And so this big report came out and it was picked up by the Climate Action 100 plus organization, which is essentially a trade organization that hangs off the side of them. And, and they represent asset managers. So everything from real estate portfolios to you know, any other type of assets in the world. And they collectively speak with a unified voice for 47 trillion, with a T, $47 trillion of assets under management. And they all agreed that climate is within the top four risks to their portfolio. And let's be honest, like things get done when the people holding the money are paying attention. And I think that's been one of our problems in the past, right? Climate and ocean has largely been a job for the activists, right? It's um, in the advocates. And there's still a need for all of the activists and advocates, some on this call, I'm sure, uh, to stay engaged. But we now have a different type of backup in the fight. And so, you know, that same organization, you know, made a pledge to start the net zero asset owners uh, coalition. And there's already $5 trillion in assets under management there. And that's just in the last several weeks they've, they've come out with this. So they're saying there's no place for our portfolios to hide from climate, meaning we now have this huge backdrop that this matters. And so what happens there, you know, they, when they said we, we, we can't hide our portfolio. Now, all of a sudden, the UC Berkeley Center for Law and Environment um, are, are now doing a study on, is it financial malpractice to not add your climate risk in your financial disclosures? So there's huge pressure coming to bear that's really raising an awareness. And so for me, now trickling into your question, Daniel, sorry for the long lead in there, but um, I get super excited because I know that you know climate bonds and invest and impact investing are the, the fastest growing asset classes you know in the world right now, and and that's that's a really big thing. It means that there's money that's now oriented towards the causes that we are collectively looking to solve um, that actually is mandated to only go into this space, and and it, you know impact investing in, in climate bonds used to just be you know a checkbox. Is it impact? Is it climate? Yes or no. But now because of the crowding of that space, there people have been forced to quantify, you know, how impactful, you know, what do you do for the climate specifically? And to do that, you end up with these massive organizations like SB uh, Global, who does um, like ratings for investment into organizations, right? And they've been around for a long, long time, as long as, you know, we've been investing in the stock market and otherwise, but their fastest growing segment is in the ESG services, the environmental social governance services. So we're seeing just a lot of momentum. And then some of that starts to spill into the ocean. So specifically what's happening in the ocean economy space that makes me excited. I, again, from that top-down approach, I'll start with the bottom later. Um, there's the high-level panel for the sustainable ocean economies. Again, it's just often referred to as a high-level panel. And that's a combination of the UN and the World Resources Institute. And they're finally paying attention and looking to line up the sustainable development goals with the ocean. And one of the things they're doing is saying, does the ocean have a chart of accounts? 
And from an economic standpoint, if you think of a chart of accounts, for those of you who maintain QuickBooks or some other means of tracking your expenses, or you've got a company yourself and you know what that is, it's, it's essentially the list of financial transactions, right? And for a nation, a chart of accounts is the GDP. And GDP has by and large lo long said, hey, you know, climate and ocean are externalities. Human, faith, uh, human health is an externality. But now that you have such pressure coming from the UN saying, hey, GDP needs to include a subset chart of accounts for the ocean, we can finally start aiming towards fixing things. So that's a high level intro. I can get into the Blue New Deal now or later. Daniel, you want to take off on your next question? Yeah, I was going to say there's, see, you guys have so much depth to each of your answers. So I'm like, I don't want to stop you, but but we do we do have more questions so that we can we can try to, you know, pinpoint a little further. Um, it's the late day coffee that's doing it, just so you know. <laughs> I was debating having coffee before this, but uh, <laughs> so the next question I have for you guys, though, is uh, I'm going to toss this back to you, Jonathan, and I'll let you kind of maybe intro the regenerative blue economy a bit. Um, but what are some emerging policies for advancing sustainable slash regenerative solutions? Well, that was just like the warmest handoff I could have. Um, so, I mean, I, I just started to mention the Blue New Deal, right? And this is a, a perfect intro for that. Um, if you don't know it, I'll just back up a little bit. Um, there's a, a salt of the earth innovator, um, uh, Bren Smith. Uh, his company is Green Wave. They do some really cool vertical stack ocean farming stuff. We'll just leave it at that, come back to it later. Um, he was in a town hall with Elizabeth Warren when she was on the campaign trail and she's talking Green New Deal, Green New Deal. And he raised his hand and said, what about the Blue New Deal? And she said, what? And he said, exactly. And all of a sudden there was this exposure that we were missing the Blue New Deal and the construct of like the Green New Deal. Um, Elizabeth Warren being, you know, pretty, you know, devoted to having a lot of detail, went back to her, you know, policy team. And by the way, I should pause here real quick. There's collaboration happening right now in policy like we've never seen before. So on her policy team is, you know, Maggie Thomas, who now, you know, started Evergreen Action, but she was previously with Jay Inslee. And when he dropped out of the race, he made his climate policy open source. So other people could take all of that legislative work and just use it. And in the past, there's a lot of hoarding going on. So there's collaboration that happens in the environmental space. We don't see other places. So just side note there. So, you know, Maggie gets tasked with developing the Blue New Deal. She, she taps, you know, one of her good friends and amazing biologists, some I mean, you might know Elizabeth Ayanna Johnson, um, just a hero of mine. And they, you know, banged out the, the Blue New Deal essentially. Um, that sat for a while. It got a little toxic as New Deal became a bad word across the aisle. Um, but then it got picked up by the Middlebury Center for the Blue Economy and they developed the Climate Ocean Action Plan. That gets us to where we are now. About five days ago, um, that got converted and released um, for legislation. There's not a bill a number associated with it, but a broad coalition of senators for the Ocean-Based Climate Solutions Act. And like, if you only take away one thing from anything I say today, follow up on the Ocean-Based Climate Solutions Act. Um, maybe Daniel, when you post sort of these show notes, I can give you some links to put in there. Um, but what that is, is the most comprehensive ocean-related policy package we've ever seen in my lifetime, right? It goes even far beyond what NOAA does in relationship to some of the policies for the ocean. And buried deep in that, you know, 100 or 347 pages is this note that talks about a website for grant distribution. And one of the senators during the press conference almost as an aside, mentioned ARPA-O. That doesn't exist today. But if you know the Department of Energy uh, grant program for ARPA-E, that means that we're going to have an ARPA-O. So finally, a dedicated grant funding and innovation body within the government that supports ocean innovation. And that's related to the SBIR grants and whatnot. So that allows now all of this innovation to, to be put forward. Um, I think I can pause there for a minute. But does that all make sense? Maybe a couple nods, a little bit? OK, cool. So ARPA-O and the Ocean-Based Climate Solutions Act is so exciting. Find a way to support it if you can. All right, Shane, do you need a, you need a refresher on the question or are you still start over? <laughs> I, I have the perfect just add on to what, what Jonathan shared. Uh, you know, in, in addition to, to those policy developments, there's another one that I'm excited for and what it could mean for, for innovation, which is the Endless Frontier Act. Um, this legislation is uh, building on the 75 year anniversary of uh, Endless Frontier, which was a, a book by Vannevar Bush. 
uh, who is the nation's first science advisor, and it essentially uh, put the groundwork uh, for a federal science policy in this country. And the next iteration of the Endless Frontier Act is promising uh, much more investment for federally funded research. We've lagged other countries over the past 10 years. In 1992, we were number two in the world for uh, federal investments in R&D as a percentage of GDP, um, which is an important qualifier to just uh, take into account the size of a country. Um, and now we're uh, well below 10th in the world. Um, so we've fallen uh, remarkably behind. And um, you know, in addition to the downstream innovation and technology development um, strategies that Jonathan spoke about, I think maintaining and growing this upstream, the building blocks uh, of innovation and ocean innovation is extraordinarily important. So um, ditto to what Jonathan said, and also support the Endless Frontier Act if you can. <laughs> I think it's a... Um, really great development. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I'd say looking away from government a bit is, you know, I, I'm really uh, excited by what the the national foundations and philanthropic community is doing focused on entrepreneurship. The Kaufman Foundation, the Lemelson Foundation, the Case Foundation, the Rise of the Rest Initiative, which is all about not having innovation just happen in Boston and in uh, San Francisco, but really having it catalyzed across the country. This inclusive approach to entrepreneurship is really valuable and it's not just public sector led. I think that's extremely useful. Um, so it's great to see universities and foundations and um, other sort of influencers in our space uh, think a little bit more seriously about the broader policy environment. Um, you know, I also think at some level, state governments are being a little bit more strategic with economic development. We're um, now a little bit more skeptical about the traditional tactics of issuing as much tax breaks as you possibly can to lure a company to your area, the site selection strategy. Um, a couple of weeks back, I was uh, on a panel at the International Economic Development Council meeting, and you know, it was my sixth time going to the IEDC conference, which is a conference for all the economic development professionals. And I noticed that this year, more than any other year in the past, people were thinking a bit more strategically about local assets for economic development. So I think at some level, there's also really exciting grassroots opportunity for local and state government to play a more proactive role in ocean innovation, but it's going to require dot connecting. I don't think a lot of the folks in the role know the opportunity in this space. So it'll be on to us to sort of do that dot connecting. So a couple of uh, additional thoughts there, Daniel. Yeah, no, and actually that's, a, that's kind of a perfect lead in into actually some stuff we've had going on this week. We just met with the Miami Chamber of Commerce and are working our way through the uh, resiliency committee that they have going on and they're thrilled to be involved. So, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's on, on one hand, you know, you'd expect the stakeholders to be the ones looking out and trying to, to build these ecosystems. Right. But at the end of the day, you know, it's on us to say, well, if we, the, you know, constituents want it to happen at some point, we have to, we have to start and, and initiate those connections. And on the other point I wanted to add to you, add to yours, Shailen is, you know, this, this notion of inclusivity for economic development, uh, I really, you know, it's it's not just a, you know, race and ethnicity, race and ethnicity thing. It's actually, I think, also just a uh, skills and, and background thing. You know, a lot of people in the ocean space or think the ocean space is only for the people who study marine science and and go go like through a marine education of some sort. And the fact is that the solutions that we need to drive for our space are all interdisciplinary, right? We we need more engineers. We need you know, more people who can just give us general policy to work into how we go about our business and how we go about our, our scope of work. Um, and, and so it's opening up that as, a, as its own source of diversity as well. Um, not, not to take away from the other side, but, you know, just, just to, I think, open some minds. Um, and then furthermore, you know, the last thing is just this, and, and, and Jonathan, I'll, I'll let you expand further than I will, but just the notion of, of a regenerative blue economy. And, and so, yeah, and that's gonna lead into our, our next question. So to me, and this is my interpretation, I'm excited to hear, hear yours, Jonathan. Uh, the regenerative blue economy is, is this 
is the sense of basically that sustainability is, is a stepping stone, right? Sustainability is saying we're going to continue doing the actions that got us to this point, but we're going to do, do them in a less harmful and less impactful way. But we're still doing the same things, right? We're still recycling plastics, which keeps plastic in the supply chain and still at some point and has a portion of plastic end up in the ocean. We're still, you know, sustainable fishing is still fishing from a largely exploited population of wild fish. And instead of leaning into things like aquaculture that allow wild populations to regenerate, right? And so, so there's really this notion that, you know, sustainability, although is a step in the right direction, and I don't want to take away from that, is not our end goal, but the beginning. And, you know, I think that those some somewhat radical solutions, uh, some might say, uh, are something that we need to start pushing if we're going to get past the, you know, 10 years of sustainable development goals, because you want to reach this the development goals and then be like, then what? Um, you know, so that that's kind of my initial take on it. And more importantly, what we're trying to facilitate here at Seaworthy. But uh, Jonathan, you want to expand further before I dive into our, our next question? I mean, sure. Uh, that's, I mean, there's so much in there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm so optimistic, but I'm also trying to be pragmatic in the sense that like we've, we've passed some event horizons already that we saw coming and sustainable was a great word that aligned up with those former paradigms and sustainable might not be good enough anymore. It's got to be regenerative. The systems have to be closed loop. They have to be able to feed themselves in a positive way. And that gets me into my thoughts on, you know, biomimicry and just using nature as the blueprint for how to proceed you know there's a lot of complexity within nature that that shows how to do things i mean gone are the days we think nature is in competition with itself it's not it's actually the most beautiful dance and balance we've ever seen and so as we move away from things like monoculture on land right row crops and whatnot they're just depleting the biome and the soil and we start looking at the interconnectedness of all of these things we have to line up our accelerators and our incubators and our innovation in those same kind of ways so, you know, back to Green Wave for just one second, and not to bore you, Daniel, you've heard me say this before, but, you know, they do this vertical stack ocean, you know, unit, right, and, and hanging on that vertical stack, first of all, it's a, it's a small footprint, you know, just attached to the, attached to the ground, um, and going up in that water column, you have um, things like bivalves, so, you know, oysters and whatnot that are filtering water by, you know, 50 gallons per organism per day, and, you know, they're also available for human consumption, and then above that, you have seaweed and kelp, and that seaweed and kelp can be, you know, used in all sorts of products as well as human consumption, right? But if you feed some of it to the cows, it, it reduces their methane production by 90%. And so there's all these interactive dynamic, you know, elements within this one stack. But, and then if you start looking at, okay, you know, where are we deploying these things? If you deploy them well and in mass, they can help with storm, storm surge and they can help with kelp forest reforestation projects, right? And, and the fun thing is they grow 25 times as fast as the rainforest and sequester five times as much carbon. So there's that decarbonization element. And so you start saying, okay, what innovation do we need to have in the ecosystem, this regenerative interactive process to make this one thing successful? Well, we have, you know, fish and um, bio monitoring AI uh, procedures now, and there's unmanned autonomous uh, underwater vehicles that can go and check on these stacks, right? And then there's the markets to take them to market. And then there's the policy elements to figure out how do we actually lease the space on the ocean floor to this innovation. And, and all these things have to be, you know, thought of like holistic. So Silicon Valley in the past would say, I want to put money towards this one thing and it better be a widget you can crank out again and again and again. And I think the lesson here as we look at permaculture as a backdrop is you have to say, you know, are all the elements put in place to support this one technology and realize that the success of that thing I just mentioned, by the way, helps with biodiversity and then helps with fisheries and helps with adjacent fisheries, which help economies. And, and, and so there's, there's all of the relatedness that we have to look at now and building the complexity of the models to support it. Um, and for me, that's what regeneration is. It's saying, okay, don't just look at this one thing you're doing, but what are all those elements that are around it? There aren't, there's no such thing as an externality. We are so incredibly connected. That's a falsity that allowed people to profiteer on other things in, 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 in days gone by. So that's my take on regenerative, um, but really closed loop is, is a better way I look at it. Oh, that's a perfect segue into our next question with Shailen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw at you which is what are some reasons for the ocean or larger science community to have optimism from an economic development perspective? You guys kind of covered some of this, but if you have any, any additional thoughts. Yeah, you know, I, I, I ditto everything Jonathan just said, especially the piece about externality as being sort of a, a, 
uh, <laughs> outdated language at this point. Um, I, I really resonate with that. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think just to, to build off what I had shared before, and actually, Daniel, something you had shared, um, the piece of sort of uh, bringing in new skills into this conversation, um, I think there is a really, really exciting opportunity for workforce development relating to the regenerative economy. Um, and I think one really exciting area for me is thinking about all of the folks who are uh, out of work, underemployed, or uh, not participating in the labor market at all, or who are uh, employed in dead-end jobs that are just low-quality jobs, poor wages, what opportunity is there to help those people find individual mobility through federal, state, and uh, regional investments in ocean innovation? Um, there's this brilliant mine, uh, Byron August, uh, who's founded this group called Opportunity at Work. And the entire premise behind this group is that we ought to be helping people who are skilled through alternative routes, STARS, uh, find uh, ways to take their uh, lived experiences and their learning, uh, the learning that may have taken place out of the traditional higher education or education ecosystem and have employers recognize the value of those skills. So I think there's actually a really untapped opportunity there. I hope economic developers are thinking proactively about how they can drive workforce development by investing in ocean innovation. And I think there's a great opportunity to, to really bring in those folks who don't have a bachelor's degree, which by the way, only 30% of the country have bachelor's degrees. So it's actually the plurality of the country that don't. Um, and think about how we can build economic mobility pathways for, for folks uh, at that level. Um, I focus a lot of my research on non-degree credentials and community colleges as engines of economic development. And I'm really excited by the prospect of green jobs, blue jobs, however we want to frame it. So uh, a couple of other thoughts there. Awesome. Jonathan, anything else you wanted to add to that? No, that's great. I, I, it's, it's all the stuff I love to hear because well, I guess I do want to add to it um, because uh, we, I mean, those are just all of the elements to come into play. You know, I, I put a data set in the chat. I, it, I based it on the Blue New Deal. I now have to change the taxonomies because they came out with the actual bill. So I've got some work to do um, on my free time. But uh, all of these components come into play, whether we look at like the success, are we going to achieve our mission or not? Like what needs to happen? And so like an ecosystem isn't just the flora and fauna. It's like, it's the policy and the economic development and the non-credential degrees and all of these things and the transition plans and the communication and the things that make people who work on oil and glass rigs less scared that they're not gonna have a job again, showing them on the front end through communication and you know embracing them that they're gonna have a job in offshore wind. You know, Just all of these elements speak to will we be successful in on our mission? And the, yeah, again, it's just all so connected. And, and I think too tied into that, that is a also interesting problem. And, and you touched on with like the oil rigs, for example, right? it, it's culture change, right? I mean, at the end of the day, right, it's, it's, it's easy to, to change, you know, a better mousetrap, but it's hard to change a culture, right? And, you know, for me, part of bringing this to South Florida is I'm, I'm from down here originally, I know how deeply ingrained a lot of unsustainable practices are in our culture, right? I mean, our, our, our bay just had a massive fish, fish kill here in Biscayne Bay, because They've just allowed agriculture and, and sewage runoff to run unchecked for years. Um, and now it's like, okay, well, now we finally wanna do something about it. Uh, so, you know, it, it's also, it's, it's really hard to sell a proactive approach, but, you know, I think we're, we're starting to see the needle turn on that, um, or at least half proactive, half reactive. So uh, I have one last question for you guys before we get started with Q&A. Uh, <laughs> I'll throw this to you again, Shaylin. Uh, how can we better bring together the environment and slash oceans, tech and innovation and public policy to create a better future? Softball. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll peg it at three levels. Uh, one is issue advocacy. I mean, we have to make this a visible, painful problem that is not easy to duck away under the rug. Um, and that's challenging. Um, it's really hard. There's so many things vying for our attention and um, 
you know, the way we're all wired is we just don't focus on consequences until it's really affecting us as individuals. So, you know, um, I don't have a good solution uh, for that problem. Um, I think it just is going to require collective action. It's going to require advocacy. As Jonathan said, we should be stepping up and calling our representatives and telling our family and friends to call their representatives to support sound legislation that will really uh, help us address this work at scale. Um, I also think there's an element of working local, um, you know, getting involved with whatever organizations are in your own region or community, no matter how large or small, that's focused on innovation, entrepreneurship, the ocean sciences, whatever uh, vertical you're most aligned with. And you might volunteer your time, you might donate some money, you might tweet them out, you might give them a little bit of visibility and amplification. I think there's something we can all do. Um, I'm actually going to drop two opportunities in the chat, but this will also be nice because of the q and I'm just curious, out of our participants, um, type the letter A in the chat if you're under the age of 30. Let's see the age distribution of this group. All right, some results are coming in. All right, we have about 17. Some of you may not be able to uh, type since you're joining by phone. Okay, so we have a sizable number of folks who are under the age of 30. I'm going to share just two organizations, and I'm sure you know you, Daniel, Seaworthy team, and and Jonathan, you all may have so many more. But I'm just going to share two really tactical opportunities. The first is, you know, Jonathan mentioned at, at the start that um, the UN has a lot of sort of issue advocacy activities going on in this space. And there's an organization, the United Nation Major Group for Children and Youth, that you all should get plugged into. I dropped the link in the chat for you to join right now. And UNMGCY is the formal mechanism for youth, people under the age of 30, to get involved in the UN, including high-level advocacy and decision-making. Um, a lot of people don't know about these structures that exist. There's also one with World Economic Forum that Daniel and I are part of called Global Shapers. Um, I think the next generation has a lot of fire to put under the feet of decision makers, and we ought to do it. Um, the other opportunity I just flag is if you're more in the research space, if you have ideas for policy, um, I run an organization called the Journal of Science, Policy, and Governance, which elevates the voices of early career scientists and engineers in science and technology policy. And we've partnered with the British government to uh, uh, elevate the uh, climate action ideas that young people have uh, aligned with the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, taking place next year in Glasgow. Uh, consider submitting to JSPG. Daniel has actually published in JSPG himself. Um, so it's a great vehicle to substantively have your ideas heard by senior decision makers. Um, I won't go on a full advertisement for JSPG, but really happy to answer any questions about both UNMGCY and JSPG. And Daniel, yeah, take home message in terms of bringing those verticals together is it takes collective action and individual action together. So um, yeah, I hope some of those resources were helpful. And and not, not trying to uh, be too shameless, but I do like using the word collective. <laughs> um, all right, Jonathan, uh, so we're gonna wrap, have you wrap up the same question. How can we better bring together the environment slash oceans, tech and innovation and public policy to create a better future? I mean, like two words, uh, common sense. <laughs> not, I'm not about the two words, um, as you can tell. Um, you know, I, I think that what we have to do is start bringing more people into the conversation so they feel empowered. Um, we were talking about the environment and we're often talking about doing work in coastlines and rural areas where we have a huge wealth of knowledge and in indigenous populations that should, must be a part of this conversation moving forward. Um, I think that I, I think a lot about uh, the book Drawdown, if you know it, which is one of the most comprehensive pieces of, of the literature, if you want to call it that, is study of how to get to zero carbon, right? And their initial results, and they change every year because everything's moving. Um, you know, they had 50 things how to get to zero carbon, right? And number seven 
was solar. And I was like, okay, yeah, I thought that'd be in the top 10, but I really thought it'd be higher. Cause like we're doing all this stuff for solar, all this money, all this, you know, figuring out the batteries and the panels and all of it. Right. But what was actually more impactful than solar was numbers five and six, which are so entwined, they couldn't separate them. And that is empowering um, women and girls globally, you know, through, through just education and frankly, just getting out of their way is going to be more impactful for environment than something else. So like just common sense to come down to say like how do we be more inclusive and and empower those around us so that's that's just the backdrop to, to, to that I wanted to touch upon um the 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 fundamentals of like how does the ocean space work and like what is ocean innovation I think that we can also do a better job at bringing in people from other industries to help innovate in the space to to shake up what's what's largely been advocates and foundations so far right um, and then figure out where where the innovation needs to occur. Um, you know, there, here's, here's a random example, right? I, I don't know if you guys know um, Y Combinator, right? Y Combinator is out of Silicon Valley. It's this accelerator. It's, you know, sort of the, the gold standard for accelerators in the world, right? And they're cranking out all sorts of stuff, right? And, and you know, there's a lot of accelerators too out there, I should say. Um, but, you know, they, they're well known. And what I think is one of their most successful innovations actually isn't any of their startups. They developed something called the SAFE round, right? It's the simple agreement for future equity. And there's a lot of startups now that use that as the benchmark for like, how do we get people to invest? And, and they opened a floodgate of investments because what they did is they sort of pre-cleaned the cap table from toxicity by removing the convertible note investor power later in future rounds, right? That gets confusing real fast, but like innovation can come in a lot of different ways. And so sometimes we're thinking like, how do we get the plastic well sometimes it's it's more structural changes that facilitate these things and so um i think for me like i put in the chat this data set i made when i first started in the ocean space in the climate space in general i was like what do i want to be a part of and i was like well i like the ocean um you know you can see me i, I live on a sailboat i'm in the water as we speak so i'm like i'm i'm all in um but i needed a backdrop to to frame it all around and this was right around the time that the blue new deal came out so i thought okay i'll figure it out end to end and right and i'm i'm my mind my mind works at the intersection of like innovation and mania <laughs> and um but i just dove right in and i started using one of my global teams and put together this data set that's still growing. It's got 30,000 fields, but it wasn't just like looking at like, what is the policy and then what's the solution? It's like looking at like, what are the EDU pipelines and like, are the investment vehicles in place and do the policies exist to do it? And is it inclusive in a way? Like just all of, all of the related parts, which comes down to a taxonomy problem is you have to label your data set. Um, but really like, I think we have to look at these things holistically and don't be afraid to do the hard work. And maybe the biggest thing we could ever do for the ocean is to have $200 million go to Zynga to build us a fully interactive game that takes into account like all of these things. So instead of Farmville, people like solving our global problems by turning the dial up on oil subsidies and looking what that does downstream to you know fishery management, right? These things are solvable. We can figure them out, right? If we can create a thousand person, first person shooter game, we can certainly tie together like policy and innovation to look at results as they impact our coastlines and our, you know, our global health. So that's, you know, it's, it's a mouthful, but those are my perspectives. And interestingly enough, you know, you talk about exposing people and connecting people to the ocean, which that's actually one of the, like the basic things, right, is just connecting people to the oceans and understanding what, e what is even going on. Um, I have a, I know someone out at Stanford who just started a, a startup that's doing like VR immersive, uh, it's called the Hydrus like an immersive uh, ocean exploration uh, VR set. Um, anyway, uh, really cool, check them out. So we are all set to start our Q&A. So if you guys have questions, what I recommend you doing is either you can use the hand raise feature or you can put your question in the chat and we'll ask you to unmute and you'll be able to go from there. Um, I have the first question already from Sharon who asked, is fish farming okay for the oceans or for the ocean environment? Um, and I'm happy to start a little, and Jonathan, I'm sure you can expand. Um, you know, th so there's a lot of commercial fish farming um, out there already, but the actual future is aquaculture, which although it sounds like it's the same, um, I, I like to draw the comparisons to terrestrial uh, farming, where basically it's like one is free range and one is one is just packed. Um, and so, you know, basically the commercial fish farming right now is is not good for the fish, not good for the environment, because basically it releases a lot of runoff and, and from f fish waste and, and also uh, things like antibiotics and other things they use to keep the fish healthy in an unhealthy environment. Aquaculture basically focuses on actually factoring environmental impact, 
and putting them in the environment that they'll be healthier and actually proven to live, I believe, live longer and grow be grow bigger. Um, I'm not an aquaculture expert, but I do remember hearing those. Jonathan, maybe you can back me up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I mean, again, common sense, like don't don't farm in these massive pens, non-native species, they will get out. They had, that's like every time they get out and ruin ecosystems. So, you know, just be thoughtful about it. But there's a, there's a responsible way to do some of these things. So fish farming in and of itself isn't a bad idea, but look at how you do it and what you're introducing to those uh, ecosystems. Awesome. Does uh, anyone else have any questions? Uh, ben, did you want to ask something about citizen science? No, I just getting people involved um, citizen science is a way to educate and generate data on a very limited budget and the goodwill of people. So that was where that came from. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I think that oh, it's, it's also an interesting cross section between, you know, the emerging trends of, of, you know, both in, innovation and entrepreneurship, but also the fact that citizens on their own are volunteering doing science and you know, maybe there's some crossover there as well as kind of like a gateway to innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, yeah, and does anyone else have any questions? Leave it open for a minute. Oh, here you go. Alyssa, you can unmute if you'd like. I'll read it for you then. Um, she said, how do we prepare people for a blue or green workforce? Sorry if I missed the explanation. No worries, Alyssa. Jalen, you want to take it first? You know, I'll, I'll give I'll give just a high level view, but I think Jonathan would have a little bit more of an on the grounds perspective on this. Um, I would really, really encourage any workforce strategy for any industry or sector to be comprehensive, not just focusing on the high skills, not just focusing on the markers that would lead to the most competitive research enterprise, because again, only 30% of our country have bachelor's degrees. We need to be thinking about non-degree credentials, community colleges. I say this having spent four years um, advocating for public research universities at APLU. I you know, believe deeply in the power of research universities, but you know, I think thinking and being mindful of ways to fund and support technicians and those who may not need a bachelor's degree to participate in the blue economy would be extremely valuable. Um, and you know, uh, I also think we need to be wary of credential inflation. It's rife in many, many industries. Um, we assume that we need degrees or master's degrees or doctoral degrees to do certain functions. And there's been a lot of evidence. I'll drop a Harvard Business Review article in the chat in a moment here. Um, there's been a lot of evidence that that's bad for business and bad for communities. It leads to rising inequality and ineffective um, returns for companies. So be careful about uh, your degree requirements and whether you really need them for, for uh, jobs you put out. Um, oh, yeah, I, I mean, I would say, I would say just, just do it. Just get involved, you know, find some way to be a part of a project, be one of the people who are actually physically, tangibly changing our world. You know, um, I am, you know, I am strapped for time, but I'm still a member of a team right now for Hack the Bay in the San Francisco Bay Area that is doing some experimentation with uh, aquaculture, permaculture in um, marshlands in the Sacramento River Delta that's uh, introducing farming practices that also create canals, channels that um, support uh, salmon migration. So rather than cutting the salmon out of the area and having this underutilized uh, wetland, uh, you know, boosting the wetland and accommodating the salmon, like find a project, get involved, get your hands dirty. I mean, if there's something that you find interesting, there's probably some team you can be on. I, I help a, a water accelerator as well called WIA, the, the Water Innovation Accelerator. And they've got this program called the uh, Water Emissaries. And their job is to bring in young people like into the fold to get them just tangible experience. And, you know, I can tell you anyone who's going to look for a job in any space, if you're coming in with a credential versus you've come in with, you know, four projects over five years, I mean, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to beat that real experience. And then you're actually changing the world today. And in the context of our timelines here, we don't really have time to wait. So get credentials if you need to, but find places you can do something you know, right now. 
It's a lot. Awesome. Well, we have time for one more. Uh, Angelo, would you like to unmute to ask your question? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm driving. So <laughs> I just left the Fort Lauderdale boat show. Today was the first day. I was there for work for a client. And I finished just on time to jump into this Zoom, which is very, very, very phenomenal topic. So thank you guys so much for, for the time to discuss this. And I feel that you know, my question was, what are the practical tools available to educate people on the blue economy? Because I just spent several hours at the boat show where there's, you know, fishing boats, people that are, you know, invested in everything that has to do with, you know, the leisure boating industry, fishing industry, leisure fishing industry. And what tools are available to educate people about this? I feel like this should be a topic that is made you know presented at these types of events right there are a lot of um brands there that are doing especially yachting brands that are doing really innovative things with solar powered yachts things of this nature there was a recently a super yacht conference around how super yachts can be more sustainable and more ocean friendly and so i'm just very curious to what are some practical tools that are available that can be presented at these types of events Hello? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm waiting for you. Jonathan, you want to jump on that one first? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, I mean, I want to, I want to give you a thoughtful answer and I don't know if I have something for you specifically. Um, I think, you know, there's a friend of mine who's a national geographic explorer and she's a sub pilot and she trains other sub captains and, um, she is working with some yacht owners who have built their ridiculous super yachts to also include platforms to launch subs from and so they know that mm -hmm. their yachts are going to largely not be used most of the time helping people making those large financial decisions and the manufacturers that if um, they are incorporating into the sales process or the you know options for configuration the ability to have a science platform that perhaps some of those vessels can be underwritten in other ways through tax breaks and incentives not that they need them um but like starting that conversation letting people know they can look at their toys differently could be a thing um and then i think you know just driving that industry in general towards sustainability so looking at things like if it's a you know smaller vessels obviously solar larger vessels have an opportunity for hydrogen um i think that's a direction to take those things uh but i mean i could go down a rabbit hole on you know helping people understand that maybe they don't need to consume as much could be another way to shape the, the planet but yeah no, I'm, I'm going to add a shameless plug to say, you know, it's creating forums like this, right? I mean, this, this is, it starts by just starting the conversation and having people like you guys accessible to tap into your brains and, you know, get lost and avoid. Uh, <laughs> there's just so much there, uh, you know, and it's just this real, to me, you know, bridging that disconnect and really giving people these, these forums, these opportunities, resources to, to get that knowledge. Shall you add to that? Yeah, Daniel, I'll, I'll say one thing to just add on, and it was actually just a response in the chat that spurred this thought, but um, try to, uh, I, I think there's value in us all reaching out to those who aren't already bought into this world. At, at some level, we're sort of preaching to the choir here, right? Um, you know, um, reach out to those who are skeptical about climate uh, sciences. Reach out to those who are um, not a part of the coalition, the willing. You can do this by publishing an op-ed in more uh, right of center outlets. You could publish in your local outlets. If you're not interested in writing, you could show up to local organizations where you know those that may not be thinking about uh, ocean innovation congregate. Um, you could connect with national organizations who are doing that rallying as well. So um, I, I think at some level, we also have to think about sort of bringing those who aren't already in our fold into the conversation. Um, some people say just start with the coalition, the willing. I think there's some truth to that low hanging fruit. But um, I think it's going to require a lot of collective action, Daniel, to go on to see where the collective um, wordsmithing. So, um, you know, that's that's the one thing I'd add there. Yeah. 
Awesome. Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm now it's like it just sticks out. I know. Sorry. Um, well, all right. With our, our last couple minutes here, I just wanted to share a quick update on our end as far as just what we have going on, because we do have one additional event this month. So I want to share that with you guys real quick. And then if you guys have any, any additional questions, uh, we do have our email. Uh, Jalen and Jonathan already put their info in the chat. So feel free to connect with them and follow up with them. Uh, either way, you know, we don't want any, any stones unturned. So uh, at that point, I'm sharing my screen real quick. Hopefully you guys can see it in a second here. You can see it. Cool. Uh, so yeah, so just real quick updates on our end. Uh, we have, uh, Ben is actually going to help me out and post a couple links in, in the chat here. Um, we are in right now in a competition to earn a 20,000 euro prize from the ocean, or it's called the Ocean Tribute through Boot, which is in Dusseldorf. Um, we, and so please uh, click the link and vote for us. Uh, there is a survey that we have. We want to make sure you're getting the most out of these. We'd love your suggestions and of course want to reward your time. So we have cool stickers uh, like these that uh, we're happy to happy to give to you. And, uh, and last but not least, we want to engage with you guys and keep the conversation going. So we just started a Slack group as well. So make sure you join that as well. And hopefully Ben will be able to grab that one. Forgot to mention that. <laughs> and last but not least, if I can get this to go. There we go. Oh, not too far. There we go. Uh, last but not least, first off, thank you to Shailen and Jonathan. This was awesome. Uh, I knew my brain would hurt keeping up with you guys and you did not disappoint. Um, I really enjoyed our, our, our conversation and hopefully you guys learned a lot. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, you know, Shailen, but also Jonathan, you guys are just full of opportunities. And, and I really think it's so important to put that out there for people. And, and I really hope that you guys who've been here today get to take up on some of what they shared because it's, it's just super lucrative for just growth and, and empowerment. Um, furthermore, we have our Q&A slash unofficial happy hour on Friday. Um, we're just going to have the Seaworthy leadership team here to answer your questions. Nothing is going to be recorded or used against you. We're just happy to hang out and get to know more about our community and, and hopefully get to know more about us. Um, so ending the note on a, on a more relaxed note after having some, some deep dives into some really great subjects. And so we really appreciate everyone coming out and be sure to follow up with us on social media and our email. And otherwise, that is all I have for you guys. So thank you again for coming. Uh, make sure you follow all of those uh, links that Ben posted in the chat, Ben for MVP. Um, really appreciate it all. And uh, we'll see you next month. Uh, keep you posted on, on our next events. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye now. Thank you. Oh, narwhal. <laughs>